Hey, this is Dominic, and this is your home for the cutting edge conversations on optimizing your personal performance, lighting up your sex life, and living a purpose-driven life of your own design. These are the topics that Dominic and I have both struggled with in our own lives and still don't always get right. This is Brian. Welcome to The Great Man Podcast. From a very early age, men learn that performance is the only thing that matters. That's a quote from Dr. Michael Addis, our guest today for our conversation about the unspoken realities of men's inner lives. So what happens to a man's inner world when he isn't performing? Because we've been taught from a very early age that the only thing that matters is performing. Well, as it turns out, it's quite a bit of a mystery, not only to the outside world, but to the man himself. You see, living a life where performance is the only metric, it doesn't leave a lot of space for inner exploration or developing emotional fluency or going deep with other men about their inner lives. And living a life this way leads to a variety of maladies like chronic anxiety, both low and or high grade, depression, a numbed out existence, compulsive or addictive behaviors, feeling isolated, alone or not understood, or at the very least, feeling confused about why your life doesn't feel better. Fellas, we've all experienced some form of what I just mentioned, but even when we recognize it, we typically keep on plowing ahead on our own, living that life of quiet desperation until something breaks so badly that we're forced to do something about it. But if you're waiting for a calamity to hit you before taking meaningful action in your life, then how in command of your life are you really? That's why today's conversation is about making the space to speak about the unspoken realities of men's inner worlds, our inner worlds, so that we can live powerful lives of our own design, on purpose, and with other men doing the same. And our guide for the discussion today is Dr. Michael Addis. So who is Dr. Addis? He's a professor of psychology at Clark University, where he's been teaching a course in mental health for over 20 years, and his research focuses primarily on men's mental health, specifically the way that men experience, express, and respond to problems in our lives, as well as how men define and relate to the concept of masculinity, which is a big topic that we got into with him today. He's a multiple-time author with books such as Invisible Men, Men's Inner Lives and the Consequences of Silence, and The Psychology of Men in Context. He's also a coach to men who want to optimize their inner world, so I've linked his email in the show notes, and if you feel really called to doing some work with him at the end of this episode, I encourage you to reach out to him and inquire about his work. So in this episode, we talk about why most men really do want to talk about their inner worlds, our inner worlds. But the condition for doing so needs to be right before we're willing to open up and how to create those conditions. Why masculinity is not something inherent that we're born with. Rather, it's become this performance, a series of actions that we take to protect and maintain our man card. Why the larger the group of men that gets together, the more likely that masculinity as a performance will emerge between men. And how to look out for these masculinity traps, as Dr. Addis puts them, which are those places where men go into performance, jockeying and competing with one another. We talk about the two most dangerous words that can leave a man's mouth when you ask him how he's doing. And then finally, Dr. Addis gives you two options that he proposes to help you reclaim and define what masculinity means to you. Enjoy this episode on the unspoken realities of men's inner lives featuring Dr. Michael Addis. All right, Dr. Addis, I discovered you when a friend of mine sent me your Wall Street Journal article last year that was titled, Anxiety Looks Different in Men. And as I went down the rabbit hole of researching you, Brian and I were both like, we need to have Dr. Addis on the show. And I reached out to you a year ago and you said, Work is crazy right now. Try me again in a year. And I bet you didn't think that I was going to try you again in a year, but here we are. And when I reached out, you said yes. So welcome to the Great Man Within podcast. 
Great to be here. Thanks for being so persistent. <laughs> that's that's one of the things we're good at here. And you know, our listeners have come to know that before we bring our guests on, we end up doing a round of Wim Hof breathing, these 30 intense breaths in and out through the mouth. And after you went through that exercise, we asked you, had, you know, did that feel strange for you? Have you ever done it? And I thought your response was quite illuminating. Why don't you share with our audience what you just shared with Brian and I? Well, I was mentioning that I'm very familiar with that type of breathing because it's used to help people with anxiety. It, it, it actually induces many of the symptoms of anxiety. So if you hyperventilate, you, you tend to overproduce carbon dioxide, um, which activates your, your nervous system. Your heart rate goes up. You, you can get sort of dizzy. You can feel energized, right? If you're if your mind is telling you this is useful and productive, like it, like it is for you all, this is sort of an energizing thing. But if your mind is telling you that the fact that my heart is racing and the fact that I feel dizzy is threatening, that's where anxiety comes from. So um, I, I thought it was kind of ironic that that's the way we started this interview. <laughs> we, we like to start things off with a very anxious note. Good. <laughs> but, but what you're talking about, oftentimes we talk about the difference between the content and the context. And the content of this is heart is racing, could be anxiety producing, but the context of this is, this is something we use to drop in together that we're telling ourselves that we have more control over our biology than, than we thought we did, so. Exactly, exactly. So Dr. Addis, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on the show is, as we mentioned before, you know, a big part of our audience that listens are really high-performing men who are up to big things in their lives. And anxiety is a natural part of life. It's a natural part of the game. But I think that many times we are in denial around like how anxiety shows up in our lives. And let, let me just start with my own self, right? Like I shared with you before we started recording that for most of my life, if you had told me I'm an anxious guy or I have anxiety, I would have argued you to the death because I had numbed out my feelings in such precise ways, whether it was through sexting or workaholism or alcohol or whatever, but I was still performing very highly in my career, in my work life, promotions. I had all the evidence in the world, right, to show you that I was performing at a high level. So I would have denied that I was an anxious person. So can you talk to us through your 20 years of teaching psychology, a professor of psychology at Clark University and teaching men and masculinity and how we deal with anxiety some of the ways that we fool ourselves as men about anxiousness in our lives and the way that shows up. Dominic, I appreciate your sharing your personal experience with that. I think that you're, that you're not alone. Some of the words that you used, even in, in that little excerpt, you know, I think are illustrative. So for example, the emphasis on performance. So as men from a very young age, we learn that performance is what matters most. So it's the ability to bring it on the basketball court, to bring it in terms of, you know, cash dollars as a provider in the home to control our emotions. If you watch professional sports, you'll often hear commentators contrasting between performance on the one hand and control of emotion on the other. And, you know, what a great job Brady does controlling his emotions in the pocket. And, you know, Tiger Woods, he's going to have to really, really sort of dig down and get his mind under control. So these, these messages start from a very young age. And of course, there's nothing wrong with controlling your emotions. There's times when that's perfectly adaptive to do. The, the challenge is when it becomes the default way of being in the world, right. uh, which sounds like it might have for you, where it was just sort of like, I don't have any feelings any, anymore. I've, I've managed to numb them out. And, and of course, feelings are there for a reason. You know, evolution brought us these gifts. They don't always feel great, but they're there to tell us how life is going. And so if we're constantly stamping them out, pushing them down, numbing them, we're losing out on important information about how things are in our world. And also, frankly, just rich, meaningful experiences as well. What, what happens when performance becomes the default? Because if I look at, at my life, if I look at, at other, other guys that I know, at work, we get paid because we perform. When we're in some sort of competition, sports or otherwise, we got to perform because that's how we get rewarded. When we're at home, right, we're expected to do certain things and perform in certain ways. So what's the alternative to performance? 
Great question. Well, I mean, so for one thing, the alternative to performance is experience, you know, so like sort of being present. I like to hike and I like to paddleboard and I like to go to the ocean and, and kayak and all of these things are very sensory oriented. You know, there's a lot of beautiful things to see. There's the awe of what I'm looking at. And I always have to work when I'm in that situation to focus not only on performance. I mean, it definitely feels great to be able to paddle my kayak at five miles an hour versus three miles an hour. And I like getting a good workout. But if that's all I'm doing, why did I kayak? I could have just gone to the mm -hmm. gym. So experience is one thing. I think connection and intimacy, you know, what it's, what it's like, not just to be in relationship with people, but to feel genuinely comfortable, you know, to feel loved as a person, regardless of how you perform. And I'm talking about how you perform sexually, how you perform financially. I mean, yes, those things matter to a relationship, but I think men, we often get in our own way and we assume that everything must be about performance when there's a lot of contexts in life where, you know, it's more about sort of just being who you are and maybe letting go a little bit, maybe being a little bit more vulnerable or giving over control of the situation and just sort of being present. What you just said about to be loved as a person, regardless of how you perform, is so profound because in my experience working with men, they have no concept of what that feels like. Yes. Like you can't, you can't even explain it in words to a man what it would feel like to be loved, accepted, valued, validated when he's not performing. And I know that, I mean, growing up, like I was an athlete all throughout growing up. And then I went into a competitive environment in college, fraternity. And then in the working world, I was in a sales organization. So like my identity was wrapped up in performance, wrapped up. And I would go to such great lengths to hide where I felt like I was underperforming or insecure. And I ended up in, in four years of an addiction treatment program, right? Sex Addicts Anonymous. That was the first place in my life. I think I was 34 years old where I was around a group of men who actually provided emotional support, love, and care when I was at my worst. And it was such a foreign feeling to me. It took me three months and my sponsor kicking his boot up my ass to tell me that these men aren't competing with you, dude. Like they're here putting their arms around you and you're keeping yourself separated from them because you think there's some sort of competition between whose addiction is worse than the others. So when you're working with men, teaching men about that, like, how do you get through to them this concept of like, there is something so much better over here. Like you can be loved even when you are not performing. How do you get through to them? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know something, Dominic, I wish I could say, well, you know what? I have six magical questions that just. Crack <laughs> me Dr. Edis, that's what we want. Go ahead and start, start with those six <laughs> magic questions. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the key to men's real inner lives. <laughs> um, I, do, I wish I don't have that, but I, I've seen a few things over the years. One is that I am convinced now that most men want to talk and share and be real and let go of some of the pressures that we experience. We just need the conditions to be right to do it. And a, yes. and a big part of that is recognizing that other men are similar. So in your case, it sounds like you had to sort of bottom out for psychological and physical health reasons were forced into a situation where you, you almost had to tolerate the intimacy and the vulnerability, and then you drew something positive from it. There's another way to go, which is to begin to talk to each other about maybe less existential sorts of things. So I talk about, for example, in Invisible Men about my interaction with the pizza guy that happened several years ago where the, the, the same guy that comes every night, you know, or not every night, but a few times a week to deliver a pizza. I knew him by sight, but not by name. And I asked him, how's it going? And he said, fine, how's it going with you? And for some reason, something clicked and I just told him the truth. And I said, well, you know, I'm having a really hard time at work. I'm behind, I'm worried about my kid. So I, I honestly, it's not a great day. And he almost dropped the box of pizza. That would have been a travesty. If it would. That. that was important, right? That's <laughs> nutritional health. Next time, let him put the pizza down before you answer a question that way. That's right. Okay. 
<laughs> so his response was, thank you so much for saying that. I'm having a hard day too. I just found out that my grandmother died in Croatia and I can't go back there to see her because I don't have a passport. Mm. And it's like, that's a powerful thing that he shared with me. And we didn't sit, sit down and be, begin to sing Kumbaya and hold hands or anything like that. I mean, it was a very brief conversation, but I think if more men had those conversations, however briefly, on a more regular basis, it sends a different message. As my friend and colleague Chris Kilmartin tends to say, most guys are not most guys, but most guys think most guys don't want to talk, don't have anything going on. Everything's fine. So then when something's not fine with me, I'm thinking I'm the weird one, you know, and whereas if I thought, hey, look, Dominic seems cool. He's had troubles in his life. Brian, you know, knows how to hyperventilate and, and become <laughs> anxious and I can hang out with Brian. He seems cool. Well, maybe I don't have to be so performance oriented all the time. Dominic and I are part of a men's group that meets every Monday night. And this was the first time in my life that started two years ago where I saw really powerful guys that I had a lot of respect for open up about what's really going on in their lives that can, and continues to give me the permission that I felt like I needed to do the same. Yes. And that's really hard to do in isolation. So what you're talking about here is really that, that connection piece. And, and uh, that has been so true in my life just very recently. I know so many men professionally and personally who have had similar experiences like that. And it can also, believe it or not, go the other way. You know, masculinity is a slippery kind of thing. We, we can do it in a lot of different ways. So, for example, I've been at a men's retreat with a bunch of men with PhDs and lots of training and all this stuff. And I've seen a process I call competitive crying going on yeah. where the, it's, yeah. the, it's the, you know, who is strong enough to break these gender roles down. And so, you know, it's like, well, now the form has changed, but we're doing the same damn thing. Same thing. That we're always yes. doing, except now we've, we've subverted it in some way. I heard a guy the other day, uh, he was telling a story about something that happened with him and his partner. And the guy listening goes, hey, did you blast her with your tears? Did you, did you, <laughs> <laughs> it's just this like idea of, like, did you blast her? Did you do it right? Right, Brian. <laughs> This is exactly what happened with us when we first started the men's group two years ago. I remember like, yes. so Brian and I were two of the guys who had a more difficulty accessing our emotions at that point in time. I've been on this, I've been doing inner work at that point for about eight years. And I still had like an inability to access some deeper feelings to, to be able to like name a feeling, feel a feeling, sit with that feeling. And I remember like Brian and I would have these sidebar conversations around like, I feel like a failure because I can't cry. Yeah. Like I feel like a failure, right? And the other night in men's group, I was I was sharing something emotional and I started crying. There was like some tears came out and Brian jokingly was like, hey, two points for tears. Two <laughs> points for tears. Like you're on the scoreboard now. Yeah, if you, if you laugh or smile, it's only one point. It's good. You're accessing the emotions, <laughs> but you only get one point. So like on the thing that you said, Dr. Addis, about men want to be able to talk. Like we want to put the bag of pressure down. That is so true. Like I, I found that men want that. And you said the conditions need to be right. What are some of those conditions that you have found that have allowed others? You just gave an example of like going first, you know, like the pizza guy said, I'm fine. He deflected, you went first, and then he opened up. What are some other conditions? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, one thing that comes to mind is that, that traditionally, this sort of, I was going to say face to face, we're computer to computer, but this sort of interaction where, you know, I'm looking at you, you're looking at me because we're on Zoom here. This is not the way boys are taught from a young age to interact with other males. We tend to do it more side by side. So if you look at some of those sort of iconic photographs from the 50s of a bunch of white males in, in jeans and t-shirts with the cigarettes you know, in the sleeve and they're leaning over an automobile engine, looking at it together. You know, it's a stereotype, but my experience has been that it's, I've often had deeper conversations with men when we're taking a walk, when we're playing disc golf or ball golf, you know, this thing about having a drink is an interesting one too. You know, do you want to get together and have a drink? And the, the drink is almost secondary to the conversation, but it gives us a external focus. So I think that that's very important. I think the other thing too, is that 
I think most men are terrified of other men. We are scared of being shamed and emasculated. And so when it comes to self-disclosure and maybe exploring our emotional lives, the more men in the room, the harder it is going to be to do. You know, the, the risks of being the odd guy out, the one that gets bullied, even if it's irrational to think that, the feeling is still going to come up and become a deterrent. So I often encourage guys, you know, if you want to develop more meaningful relationships with other men and be more real about who you are, start with the people closest to you and start in small ways. So I think, I think that matters as well. I also think that unfortunately, mental health treatment has become so stigmatized for people in general, and especially for men. You know, one of the things that got me into this field was studying the reluctance of men to go to counseling trying to figure out why am I the only guy in my PhD program right now? And why are most of my therapy clients women? What, what's happening here? So I think as that changes, and it is changing, that opportunity to go to counseling or to go to coaching, to talk to a minister in your church, to talk to a barber, there are opportunities for communication everywhere. It doesn't have to be with a professional. Dr. Annis, that point that you made about guys being terrified of other guys, I have felt either either terrified, I probably would have qualified it as I'm in competition with them. Okay. Going to a bar, comp but there is some sort of competition, some sort of fear. And when I talk to other men about going deeper, about being more vulnerable, oftentimes what I get in response is, sure, Brian, I can do that with you here. But in general, in life, there's too many risks. It's not a safe space to do that. He's like, for example, a lot of my background is in the HR strategy space. And maybe being vulnerable at work is unsafe because of a fear of not being able to perform or, or getting a bad performance review and it affects the bottom line. So could you talk just a little bit about the difference between that condition of safety that these men are talking about? So to me, I think there's a lot of wisdom in what you're saying. I think, I, I think of two things. One is that context matters, and there are, are varieties of ways to be real and open and honest. So let's take HR or, you know, sort of working in a corporate environment. You know, I probably wouldn't suggest to a coaching client that they, they begin to, you know, d disclose by walking into a, a weekly meeting and, and talking about how depressed they are and how much of a struggle it is to get your work done and how there's, you know, a, a strain in your marriage and so on. I mean, I think the, the risks there are real, potentially. But I think that what often happens with men is that we lose that muscle of how to disclose, how to be real. And so we forget that we have it. Something as simple as saying in a meeting, you know, I'm really struggling with this one. You know, if there's some task that you're supposed to do as a team, I'm coming up blank. What do other people think? I could use some help here with this. I think we're at a place, in America at least, where that sort of collaborative effort it tends to be rewarded. Being a good team player matters. And sometimes being a good team player means being more real about who you are and what your strengths and weaknesses are. I think the other thing, too, is that when I work with people individually on sort of developing the quality of relationships, I'll push back and challenge some on the assumption that I can't do this. There's too many risks. It's hard to know what the risks are if you're never doing something. Right? And so a lot of times, you know, men are humans and humans tend to over exaggerate the negative consequences of doing something that we're afraid to do. This is characteristic of anxiety. If I take a walk outside, I'm going to have a panic attack and pass out on the street and embarrass myself. That's not all that different than, you know, if I really tell my girlfriend how I'm feeling, that I really haven't gotten over it since my parents got divorced, and I, I have episodes of depression where I just loathe myself, she's not gonna wanna be with me. That's a prediction, that's not a fact. You know, and so I think part of how one overcomes this reluctance is by taking calculated risks, you know, just like you do in anything else. You get outside your comfort zone, take a calculated risk and observe the results. Did, did this get me closer to the kind of life I want to live?
something Dominic likes to say is that guys are always looking for efficiency. Mm-hmm. And I love the, your your pizza example because saying I'm fine, I'm fine immediately cuts to the chase. We're done. We didn't actually, but we also didn't actually connect. So I think there's probably there are times in which for in my life in a, where I do want to connect and I want to go deep. And there is some times where I just I think surface level is perfectly OK. Yeah, sometimes sometimes it is that. And we, we had um, Sam Webb come on this podcast a number of months ago. He runs a mental health charity called Livin. And he actually said the two most dangerous words that can come out of a man's mouth are I'm fine because it's typically a shield to to what's actually going on underneath him and his best friend Dwayne the last two words that he said to Sam were I'm fine before he took his life that night and it was you know basically the birth of this new mental health organization called Livin and and what's what's interesting about what you said earlier Dr. Addis is you know mental health has taken on this stigma and I don't say taken on I don't want to say that it, it's it's it seems to have always had this stigma around it. And one of the things I love about living is they're destigmatizing it. They're making cool to talk about it. They have like all this great sports apparel that people wear. I buy it and I wear it all the time when I'm working out. But one of the things that I have found when it comes to men doing the inner work, it's typically two paths. You know, the guys who are like, I'm here for performance, right? Like I want to up my game. I want to get an edge. And so we get a lot of guys who find us this way. And then we Trojan horse the hell out of like mental health stuff. And then there's the other category of guys where something is broken beyond repair, like they can no longer ignore it. And it's like Tony Soprano, who does like face plants and his panic attacks that finally gets him into Dr. Melfi's office, you know, and talking about his inner world. So what I'm curious is, you know, you've been teaching for 20 years about this stuff, specifically to men and around issues of masculinity. What shifts have you seen, if any? And are they for the better over those two decades in the way that men are talking about and inquiring about mental health? Yeah, that's such a good question. So the short answer is yes, things have changed. And I like the changes that I'm seeing. So concretely, the first time I taught a psychology of men course in 2000, I had uh, 15 people in the class. I had one guy and 14 mm-hmm. women. And that has slowly changed every year. So I'm at about 50-50 gender-wise now. And I think, you know, from interviewing students and asking them about that, one of the assignments in the class is for them to, to reflect and write about what they have told people about being in this class and how people react to that. And it's very interesting to hear both men and women talk about the curiosity that their friends have about this class. You know, what are you doing in there? And the reactions are everything from sort of your, you know, what, why do we need a psychology of men class? Men are simple. We just want sex and food and sports and money, right? To, wow, I wish I could take that class, but I don't know if I want my friends to know that I'm taking that class. Right. So it's oh interesting. You know, why? I always say one of the first rules of masculinity is don't talk about masculinity. I'm drawing from Fight Club, obviously, but it's masculinity is one of these things that we're taught as men to be intensely worried about, to monitor all the time, make sure we've got enough of it. And it's also something that can be taken away so easily. And so the notion of even talking about it is potentially threatening. Like, you know, when I started doing this work, I I would have professional colleagues openly ask me, why are you doing this? Are you gay? You know, is this why you, so. You would get that question. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and never got the question before, but there's something about taking an interest in men's mental health, men's emotions, masculinity, that, threatens to undermine the whole system. And what I'm seeing now is that it's way more in conversation than it was 20 years ago. That's big time. There were no podcasts like this that I was aware of. It's showing up on television. It's showing, you know, The Sopranos is a great example, but there are many others. Dr. Adams, before we hit the record button here, you mentioned that masculinity is something that we often talk about, even if that's the rule number one, we often don't define it. I'm curious how you define masculinity. 
I'll tell you how most people think about it, and then I'll tell you how we tend to think about it in the field. So most people think about masculinity as those things that make men men, right? So it's sort of like, you, know, you can list them off, right? Like it, having a lot of sex, making a lot of money, being good at sports, being physically strong, taking care of women, being a provider. Yes, I feel an inner growl coming up. Yeah, there you, you go. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you can't even lay those things out without those sort of associations happening. So, so masculinity is, I think, historically seen as something internal and something essential to being a man. And the way we tend to think about it, people who teach and do research in this area, is that masculinity is something that starts externally. It starts as a set of ideas. You could call them gender roles. You could call them ideologies or beliefs about how people should be. And those roles and ideologies come to sort of get soak into our consciousness through our interactions with our fathers and with peers and other men as adults. And what they do is they generate a series of performances. And, and to me, this is, this is really what masculinity is, is it's, it's performance. It's actions that we engage in to make ourselves credible as men and to, and to avoid having our man card pulled, right? So, you know, for example, right now, if, if you started asking me questions about the NFL, even if I'm, you know, not a big NFL fan, I'm going to feel compelled to be credible in that masculine context and to say something about the Patriots, even though I don't know oh, anything about I'm feeling, I'm feeling you on this one Are right you? now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, a week ago, my partner and I are both working from home. She's out in the, in the kitchen area. I'm in, I'm in the guest bedroom. And I was on a phone call and I came out. She said, wow, she's like, I usually can't hear your voice when you're doing a meeting, but I really heard your voice in this last meeting. What was going on? And I realized in that meeting, I was completely out of my wheelhouse. It was not a topic that I had a lot of knowledge on, but I was trying to be credible in that moment. And so I got louder. Mm. Yeah. And that's why. She said that. Now, what would have been way more comfortable for me is to just tell the person that I was on Zoom with, that, like, look, this is not my area. But I didn't want that because that credibility would have potentially gone away. So this one is really hitting home here. Was that person on the other end of that meeting male? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It can creep in really, really, in really subtle ways. And the cool thing is you can also learn to recognize it and, and sort of, you know, de-escalate. And another thing I think it's really important for, for men to learn if they're interested in, in working on their own development is that the same things we need to work on, which free us up emotionally, are the same things that empower women and reduce this sort of misogyny and sexism that we're all raised with. So, for example, when we cut other men down with terms that are derogatory towards women, like we, we call other men, a, a you know, a vagina. We don't use that word, but we, you know, you yeah. know what I'm talking about, right? We're casting other men out. We're teaching them to be afraid of us, and we're also devaluing women in that process. You know, what are we saying? If you say to a guy, "You throw like a girl," what are you saying to him about girls and women? That's right. So, to me, one can become aware of the enactment of masculinity, act in intentional ways to avoid it. And in doing so, you know, we, we better our own mental health and the mental health of other men. And we also empower women, which I think is extremely important to do. Absolutely. You know, you talk about how like masculinity is now a performance, right? And Brian just gave you an example of how he performed. I, you know, back in college, one of the ways that I performed, like I, I've never been great at holding my liquor, you know, and like, I'm not actually a better human being when I'm drinking. Some other people can be funny, life of the party, like I'm not, but I would always try and keep up so I wouldn't be called the thing that you just talked about. And so like all of us have these performative aspects. I think the things that we're aware of, we can name, but there are probably countless times where we don't even recognize that we are performing. And to your point earlier, we need to make sure we have enough masculinity. Otherwise the man card can be stripped of us. I remember going to Esther Perel's she had a summit here in the city called the paradox of masculinity. And one of the things that she taught me there was that, you know, when it comes to femininity, you know, women don't really have to prove it. 
You know, it's just like, you know, they, like they step into their menstrual cycle, they step into womanhood, there's like just a series of things and now they're a woman. And for masculinity, it's this thing that we have to fight for, vigilantly maintain. You can lose it in a moment's notice, like not finishing your beer. And, and so what then is like the new masculinity? Like, you know, how do you define what healthy masculinity is in today's era? Boy, you're going for the big, important questions here. And I, I have a lot of respect for that, for the work that you're doing. Here's a, maybe a, a useful starting point to address that question. I think of this as the option of reconstruct or deconstruct. So one option is define a new masculinity. If, if masculinity is important to you, in other words, to feel good about yourself, you must feel good about yourself as a man. Then do a sober, not a, not a literally sober, but a, a critical self-reflection, a sober analysis of what your current beliefs are about what it means to be a man. And ask yourself, are these working for me or not? Hmm. You probably find they're working in some contexts and not in others. And then the question is, can I reconstruct that at all? Do I need to let go of some of these? Do I need to add others? For example, there are researchers who work in the area of what's so-called positive masculinity, which is the, the attempt to identify, measure, and study positive things that men do that they're taught through gender socialization. So honor, honesty, courage, integrity, and so on. Those are examples of, uh, I think, reconstructing masculinity. The other option is deconstruct. And I think that's sort of where I fall in my personal life. When, and to deconstruct it is to say, in effect, whoa, hold on here. Since when do I have to worry about being a man? You know, I, mm. society identifies me as male based upon my body and the sound of my voice. And that's fine. But it's my choice whether I have to invest a lot of energy in performing masculinity, hmm. good or bad. Rather, I could become more focused on becoming the kind of person I want to be, regardless of gender. And so in my life, that's I just try to look out for masculinity traps, you know, it, it, instances in which hmm. The performance of masculinity is being sort of taken for granted. And then I ask myself, do I want to engage in this or not? Yeah, well, I, this is new stuff for me. I'd never heard of like the, these perspectives of reconstruct or deconstruct. What are some of these masculinity traps that like, we can look out for that you just referenced? Well, certainly like talking about sports is one of them. You know, anytime there's a number of men getting together, it, it, it sort of seems to be the rule that the more guys you get together, the greater the pressure to perform masculinity, I think it must go back to the playground. You know, it's like, who are we going to torture here? <laughs> we're gonna, <laughs> we got to pick someone and I hope it's not me. Or sometimes the pressure is not so much about, you know, calling out another guy or, or stealing his man car, but it's about emotional restriction. You know, you've got the seven guys sitting around before a meeting and the, how's everybody doing? And everybody's fine. Nobody's got anything going on. You know, that's a different kind of performance. So all of those things are traps. I mean, you can think about gender being present in someone's life materially and symbolically, I think. So if it's materially present, let's say if masculinity is materially present, that's like, look at the three of us right now. We're, we've got three men physically present, not in the same room, but we're, we're three guys. The odds that there's going to be some performance of masculinity go up. Right. Mm. We also, though, have the opportunity to reconstruct or deconstruct it as it's unfolding, because we have that potential, you know, as human beings. It can also be present symbolically. So, for example, if you turn on a football game, you know, and you're watching football as a, as a group of men, it's symbolically all over the place. You know, we're attacking the defense. We, we right. We're penetrating war, war analogies yeah war analogies. It's all the yeah. war analogies all the discourse about toughening up and isn't it awesome that joe theisman's you know femur is sticking out of his ear or whatever whatever it was that it happened to him there so you know you i think it's important if you want to change to learn to recognize those situations that can function as traps 
you don't have to avoid them. It's just, you know, you sort of try to play a little bit, try to try to act in different ways, increase your flexibility. For the record, I've tried to keep my voice intonation down during this <laughs> podcast. I, I haven't gotten too loud. Yeah, Bri, you, you've now exposed yourself for the indefinite future. Anytime you start to get louder, I will know you have no idea what I'm you're talking I'm completely <laughs> full of shit at that point. Yeah, yes. so that's a tell. Um, yeah, so Dr. Addis, I know that you know over 20 years, you have a lot of experiences working with men. I know you're doing coaching now, working with men around some of these issues. Are there some stories that come to mind about either you know, someone that you've worked with is, that's been grappling with these concepts of masculinity or anxiety or performance that you feel like there, there's a particular lesson to be told and, or, or a success story that you feel good about that you want to share? Oh, my. I mean, there's so many. I really encourage people to watch the film. I think it's The Mask We Live In. It's about young boys, but there's some great success stories there about young boys and adult men rethinking their relationship to all this stuff and developing a richer emotional life. I know in my own life, this, this work, being aware of it, has gone from being an intellectual curiosity to something deeply personally important. And I feel like my relationships with people of all genders have gotten better as a result of this. You know, I'm able to, to let my partner do things that I think I would have reflexively done myself, uh, you know, because of my training and in, in what masculinity means. And I've also seen, you know, stories of things that are heartbreaking. So, for example, um, in one of the research interviews that I did a few years ago, I was speaking with a man who had significant symptoms of depression and anxiety, clinical depression. So he could not get out of bed in the morning without feeling incredibly morose and having, having suicidal thoughts. Um, his heart was racing all the time. He was sweating. And um, I asked him at one point, uh, you know, have you considered getting help for this? And, and his response was, no, I would never do that. Why is that? Well, because I don't believe in this stuff. Depression means you can't even function. I go to work. I provide for my family, so I'm not depressed. When I'm feeling this stuff, I'm just being weak. Oh, yeah. There. Think about our earlier conversation about performance and how important performance is. What this guy was essentially saying was, it's okay if I'm miserable. What's most important is if I do my job. Wow. So that's an incredible thing if you think about it, that and I think there's a lot of men out there who have learned to tolerate being miserable or stressed all the time or anxious all the time. So, yeah, I'm, I mean, there's so many stories. There, there was one story that we saw in the research that Dominic pulled. Uh, it was during an interview study that you did. And I'm hoping maybe you can elaborate on it a bit. It was about a guy that had daily panic attacks and was a construction worker. Yeah, so this was an early research interview um, that I did, I think, probably in the early 2000s. And, and this was somebody, we'd done a study where we were looking for people specifically who had significant symptoms of anxiety or depression and did not want professional help. And this was a guy who was working in, I don't even know what you call it, but it's non-residential construction, you know, like the large buildings with the scaffolding and stuff, you know, where you're hundreds of feet up in the air. He was out there walking on those beams having daily panic attacks. And for anyone who doesn't know what a panic attack is, it's imagine that you just saw a saber-toothed tiger rushing at you with its you know, teeth bared. What your body would do under those conditions is what a panic attack is, except there's no saber-toothed tiger. So, so people out of the blue start to have rushing heartbeat and breath and dizziness and a sense of unreality and the feeling like you gotta run away. And this was happening to him, you know, 300 feet up in the air. He never thought that this was an illness that he could get help for. He thought it was a weakness on his part. He thought it was, you know, essentially not having the balls to handle the situation that he was in. And so he's actually one of the participants that once we started talking about it and I was showing him some information about you know how common anxiety disorders were that he decided to go and get help for it and was able to get the panic attacks under control 
that's why conversations like these are so important because my heart goes out to this guy because he thought it was weakness. He didn't have the balls. I'm sure there were plenty of other guys who were walking around just like making a big deal out of it, right? Like this is how, this is what a man does. Like he walks out, he walks on beams a thousand feet off the ground without safety equipment. And then there's usually some alpha dogs who will make fun of anyone else who's, who, you know, who shows any signs of weakness. So then this guy keeps it inside. And then, you know, like, you know, so take less extreme examples because I've never been on top of a beam like that before, but like I worked in a sales organization and, you know, like people have fears about hitting their sales goals every year, but then there's no room to express that because you're weak. You're not a man if you fear that, but that's where we medicate with too much alcohol or we emotionally eat or we see women on the side or men on the side that are outside of our primary relationships to blow off steam because they do the things that our partners won't do. I mean, there's just like so many different ways in which we, I guess, are outlets for anxiety without knowing that we are avoiding anxiety. And instead, right? And like, and, and they're, they're great short term solutions. But when you stack them up on top of doing that over years and decades, like you become a person you don't even recognize anymore. And it, I can speak from my own personal experience. You know, like I hurt some people in the process. So, what you're saying and what you're doing through your coaching, through your teaching is like, well, you can talk about this stuff. You're not alone. And th there's so many different avenues that we can use to heal from this stuff and empower ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And a critical issue is the, the misperception of how common these things are. So we did, for example, a study at our university where we asked all students, male and female and otherwise, to estimate how many male students would say that they are lonely and wished that they could be more open and real with other men. Huh. And what we found was that all students of all genders dramatically underestimated the number of men who would say that, would say, huh. I'm lonely and I wish I could be more real. So what that says to me is that at least in that context, but I would suspect many others, all of us, men, women, have a perception of men's desire to be more open about what they're struggling with that is out of touch with reality. We think men don't want to talk, and in fact, they do. The other thing I just want to make really clear for your listeners, too, is that anxiety disorders are one of the great success stories of mental health treatment. So the majority of them can be effectively treated in relatively short term, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, six, eight, 10 sessions of therapy. There are also medications available that are helpful, but in my experience, a lot of men don't want to take those for a variety of reasons. But a lot of guys are not aware that there are scientifically proven counseling processes out there that are helpful with anxiety that do not involve digging up your, your, deepest childhood traumas, right? you know, that are very much about present focused coping, learning how to manage anxiety and depression. Is that what you offer? I mean, through your coaching, you know, like those six to eight, 10 sessions? I'm not a licensed clinical psychologist. I don't treat mental health per se. My coaching practice focuses more on enhancing positive aspects of, of human well-being. Yep. But there are certainly resources out there, abct.org is the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies. That's a great um, resource for finding treatments for anxiety. Also, CARD, the Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders at Boston University, is a world-renowned anxiety disorder treatment center. All right, Dr. Addis, I have a question that probably, it pops up into my head. I haven't said this to anybody yet, but probably at least twice a week, this comes up for me. I think about the work that Dominic and I do with the inner work, and I think about how I got started on this journey when I started asking myself some of these questions is when I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. And I wonder, the question that comes up to me pretty regularly is, does this stuff just get better with age? Like as I get older, when I think about the older people in my life, grandfathers, they seem to be more in touch with their emotion. They seem to be more empathetic, more caring. And, you know, is this a younger problem and, and we just age out of it? What have you seen in your experience? Yeah, good question. Well, there's a sort of a truism out there that as men approach retirement, we become 
more interested in relationships. It's almost as if once the official performance pressure in the domain of work gets taken away, then we start looking around and going, hey, you know, how much time do I have left on this planet? What's meaningful to me? What's missing in my life? That said, uh, you know, I've met plenty of men in their 70s uh, and older who are fully capable of shaming other men and, and <laughs> denying their emotions and, and all of that stuff. I mean, I, I tell one story in Invisible Men about playing a round of golf with four guys in their 60s and 70s who'd been friends for years, and they were just ripping each other to shreds and insulting each other's masculinity and, and the whole thing. And, and of course, you know, on one level, it's sort of humorous, but at the same time, um, one of them let it be known that he had just had a prostate biopsy. And rather than anyone even saying, wow, how are you doing? They immediately began to say like, well, you know, did you enjoy it? Um, right. you know, how long did right. it last? And all the homophobic stuff. And so I don't think there's anything magic about getting older, you know, but I think if you're motivated and your eyes are open, it certainly provides the opportunity to let some of this stuff go, to be a little bit more flexible in, in how we respond to our emotions and so on. The idea of getting to retirement and then asking what actually matters to me and then finding out it's about relationships seems like a lot of wasted time. I couldn't agree more. And, and what I was going to say is that I think a lot of men um, get to starting to wonder about this stuff through exactly the sort of thing you went through. Some sort of life event that says, whoa, wait a minute. Like what, what's happening here? You know, it could be testicular cancer. It could be divorce. You know, it could be the loss of a loved one. It could be the loss of a job. But something has to sort of shock us a little bit, I think, especially with something like testicular cancer. You know, I imagine that in addition to having an illness, you've got now an illness that is directly involved with cultural meanings about masculinity. And I'm willing to bet that you got a wide range of reactions from people around you, particularly men, to that experience. I'm very sensitive to the word balls, plural. But other, other than that, yeah, we, we use inclusive, we use inclusive language around here. So balls or ball, ball. Um, just to make sure that everyone feels like they're included. And, you know, Dr. Addis, what you're talking about with like these wake up calls, you know, we talk about on the show that the number one enemy to living a powerful life is this state of drifting and drift is a concept that Napoleon Hill champions in his book, outwitting the devil and that life condition of just kind of like going on autopilot. And we guys need either the, you know, testicular cancer or sex addicts anonymous or a global pandemic. And like these wake up calls can be beautiful things for us to ask deeper questions. But if the only thing that catalyzes you asking those deeper questions is an outside force thrusting itself upon you, then how in command of your life are you really? So like it's conversations like these, it's work like you're doing the, hopefully the work that we're doing, that's waking people up to other ways of going about this. Your perspective here has been super helpful. I've got a whole bunch of takeaways for myself personally, and I'm going to be downloading into the show notes as well. And Dr. Addis, if there's someone now who's like, Dr. Addis is my guy, you know, like I want to, I want to go work with him. What's the best way that they can find you? Well, probably through my Clark University website. So I'm on the faculty there. My email address is M A D D I S Mattis at C L A R K U. Edu. That's probably the best way to get a hold of me and, you know, happy to talk to people. Cool. I'm going to link all that in the show notes. Dr. Addis, thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom and for the work that you've been doing. I mean, like, you know, for decades, Brian and I are just kind of newer to this and, and helping others. The fact that you've been here for decades doing it allows like you've paved the way for, for more of us to come online and talk about this stuff. So thank you for everything you've done. Thank you. <laughs> That was one of those conversations that Brian and I just left buzzing. I mean, the time flew by. Hopefully you enjoyed it as well. And if you want to continue doing more inner work and are looking for more resources to support you on your inner journey, head over to doinnerwork.com forward slash resources, doinnerwork.com forward slash resources, where we've got a variety of book lists, guided meditations, and 
the first chapter of my new book on purpose leadership, which is available for free download. Everything there is available for free download that you can get just by going to doinnerwork.com and clicking on the resources tab or doinnerwork.com forward slash resources. Mm -hmm.